Let me uh, first thank uh, Ned for uh, giving me the opportunity to moderate this session on Trump and regulation, which is in fact an exercise in political economy, because we all know uh, that the science of economics was born in the first place uh, out of a debate on regulation versus deregulation. On the issue of trade or regulation of credit, uh, just listen to uh, what Turgo, uh, the, the finance minister uh, in the 18th century of Louis XVI, uh, said. Please, could you give, I will, I, will, I will say it in French, you will have the flavor of the French language, but you can have the translation here. He says, le prix de l'argent se règle comme toutes les autres marchandises par la balance de l'offre et de la demande. La loi ne doit pas plus fixer le taux de l'intérêt de l'argent qu'elle ne doit taxer toutes les autres marchandises qui ont cours dans le commerce. 18th century. Or, another quotation on trade. Il n'est point du tout vrai qu'en général, l'effet de la liberté ne soit ni ne doivent être de rendre le grain plus cher. Et il est prouvé que le prix doit au contraire en diminuer dans le plus grand nombre des cas. And he adds, thanks to the liberty of commerce, le sort des cultivateurs pris individuellement en doit sans doute être amélioré. Mais cet objet est une bagatelle en comparaison de l'avantage immense qui doit en résulter pour la culture en général. So you see, the French Revolution, inspired by the encyclopedist, has been a movement in favor of freedom of uh, entrepreneurship, the famous Law Le Chapelier, freedom of commerce, and the defense of property rights. Time have changed. Today, politically, deregulation is more on the right, uh, why uh, regulation is more on the left. But things are not so simple. Look at Trump, who wants deregulation to be uh, considered as the best accomplishment. But uh, he's also leaning towards protectionism. So to look at these issues, we have two distinguished speakers. Let us start by Philip Howard, the founder of Common Good and author of uh, The Rule of Nobody. Philip, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Edmond. It's, very, it's an honor to be here. I've been energized by the discussions so far. Um, at Tocqueville, uh, I wrote a book about uh, the French Revolution uh, called The Ancient Regime, in which he described uh, one of the main uh, motivations for the revolution being the micromanagement of uh, people um, in the provinces by the court of Louis XVI. You couldn't fix a steeple without getting approvals of the most minute details of some obscure minister, which would come nine months or longer after the request would put in. They regulated how you um, uh, uh, harvested your crops and such. And according to Tocqueville, the, uh, this, this micro-regulation, this micro-management by the court um, uh, is, was one of the factors that ultimately led to, to, to the revolution against the court. I think something uh, similar has happened um, in this country in the election of Trump. I'm going to talk specifically about what Trump has done with regulatory reform since I'm act actively involved in it, somewhat involuntarily, but nonetheless, uh, uh, it, actually involved in trying to do some of these changes. Um, but I think the motivation for, for Trump's getting elected in part was this sense of, of Big Brother uh, imposing um, daily choices on people through society. And I think they, much of the populace sees correctly the opportunity, I think, that was alluded to by Professor Furman, which is that so many parts of our regulatory system and our tax code are broken. They can't be fixed. They can't be tweaked here and there. They actually need to be remade, as, as Professor Furman suggested, of the tax code. 
the opportunities here for what maybe could be called regulatory reform are enormous. Uh, I would challenge you to find a regulatory program or indeed any government program that isn't broken in substantial part. But it's not, in my view, because the programs are addressing the wrong goals. It's because no one ever goes and adapts them and makes them work. They simply get enacted in 1975 and then they sail on towards, towards immortality <laughs> and no matter how they work. Um, uh, apropos of um, Angus Deaton's lunch speech, I'm probably the only person in the room who grew up in Appalachia, in eastern Kentucky, where my father did social work. Um, um, it is a place uh, where there's no dignity left, or little dignity, dignity left, because uh, there's nothing for people to do. Uh, there's a hopelessness in eastern Kentucky, which was true even when I was growing up, and has only gotten worse. Um, and I think voters, again, want the dignity of waking up in the morning and having a role in their families' lives, in their community, and such. And part of this has, again, been taken away from them um, in the case of Appalachia by the economy, economic forces, in the case of much of America by, by bureaucratic forces. And finally, Michael Massing uh, asked a question um, that, that made me think that there are many challenges that need to be met here. Income inequality, jobs disappearing from jobs from towns overnight where they're employment based, not like the decline of the coal industry, it's just because of them, whoever owns Maytag decides to move the factory to Southeast Asia. Those people have, have no place to work. That was the main employer for the town in Nebraska or wherever. And we don't have, we have this uh, regulatory pro system that's been built more or less, uh, people talk about legal codes. We don't really have legal codes. We have a, a kind of a junk pile of programs that have been built uh, year after year, piled on top of each other. No one, or rarely do people make sense of it. And meanwhile, we use enormous resources there, and we don't address the new problems, like the, the, the problems of globalization, one sort or another. Uh, so the opportunities here to fix all of those things um, could be transformative of society, of dignity, of uh, economic energy, but it requires one shift which is a willingness to actually remake the system. Nowhere and in our political dialogue is anyone talking about remaking the system. We're going to talk about Trump's rhetoric in a second. Um, there's a, the, to me, the original sin of Washington reformers is small thinking. They assume things work the way they do because they should work the way they do. That's not true. No one designed the system of government, the system of regulation that we have. It just accreted over time. And like the court of Louis XVI, it will eventually break. It will break not for, in our case, because of economic reasons, because we're such a rich country and have great culture, it'll break for the same reasons that Trump got elected. It'll break for cultural reasons. Okay, so what has Trump done? Uh, he came in, he promised um, to drain the swamp, to get rid of unnecessary regulations, and I will say that his attitude itself seems to have had a kind of a bolstering effect on the economy. Businessmen, mm -hmm. businessmen kind of know that they're not gonna have the knife stabbed in their back or a bunch of new OSHA rules put on them, and that, that may indeed be part of why the markets are doing so well uh, and such. But if you at, look at what Trump has actually done, uh, it's almost, in my view, nothing. He uh, early on had an executive order called one in, two out. For every new regulation, you have to take two out. What he's done has been studied. It's really completely insignificant. I mean, there are regulations about how many days it takes to get from this place to that place, you'll get rid of one of those regulations <laughs> and put in a new one. Is it, uh, he had an executive order, which I actually think is 
potentially constructive about um, on the order of um, creating a equal regulatory budget so that you don't um, you won't increase the burden, the economic burden of regulations uh, with new regulations unless you reduce by similar amount them somewhere else. I think that's actually a good budgeting idea for regulation. It was a, who was it that originally proposed that years ago? Was it Niskanen or someone like that? Um, the uh, but. The reality is that those have made no effects on regulations. He did rescind 14 Obama-era regulations under something called the Congressional Review Act that allows Congress within a certain period of legislative days to uh, veto regulations. And it has to be signed by the president, in this case, by simple majority vote. In this case, Congress did rescind 14 Obama era regulations, the president signed them. Uh, some of those regulations struck me as actually quite important regulations. Like, for example, there was a stream protection rule that regulated how much waste that uh, mining companies could dump into nearby streams. Again, as somebody who grew up in Appalachia, you sort of care about whether the streams are polluted or not. Another regulation that Obama uh, rescind, I mean, sorry, that, 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 that Trump rescinded was uh, a rule that prohibited people with mental illness from buying guns. Again, I'm personally, <laughs> personally, knowing a lot of people with mental illness, I, um, I, I actually don't want them to have guns. Um, so after, uh, I did not support Trump, but after Trump was, uh, or before Trump was elected, I'd written um, a white paper um, called Two Years, Not Ten Years, Redesigning Infrastructure Approvals, uh, which got the attention of the candidates. Hillary was citing it, other people were citing it. Uh, and one of the things that, that I found in this report is that um, lengthy, a lengthy permitting processes, environmental review and the like, more than doubled the cost, the effective cost of large infrastructure projects in this country. So it's a significant economic burden on the building of new infrastructure. It also found that lengthy environmental review was dramatically harmful to the environment because it prolongs fixing the bottlenecks of you know, creaky uh, electric lines that waste the electricity, Bottle, traffic bottlenecks that uh, cause traffic jams and cause pollution and, and the like. Um, after Trump got elected, I was put on his CEO council. And so I figured, well, I'm interested in the reform, so I'll try to be helpful. Uh, he explicitly endorsed um, the proposals I had in creating clear lines of authority to make decisions um, and the like. But his attitude towards all reforms is he'll do whatever he can by executive order and doesn't even want to go through the trouble, I think my colleague here is going to talk about that, of actually um, going through the Administrative Procedure Act to change rules that he doesn't like, much less propose new statutes. So with the help of two former general counsels of EPA, one a Democrat and one a Republican, um, my not-for-profit group, Common Good, drafted uh, legislation to streamline the permitting so we would save the money and, and get projects built uh, without unnecessary delay. Our proposal, including the explanations of all the legislative language, was three pages long. For example, it gives the uh, chairman of the Council of Environmental Quality the authority to decide issues on the scope and adequacy of environmental review. Still has to comply with the statute, which requires you do an environmental review in good faith. But in the case of one uh, uh, project I'd written about, which was raising the roadway of the Bayonne Bridge to allow ships, new generation of ships to go into Newark Harbor, the project uh, had virtually no environmental impact uh, because it was using the same foundations and just raising the roadway of the old bridge. Uh, the environmental assessment required to, um, to do the project, which took five years, 
uh, was 10,000 pages plus another 10,000 pages of, of, of appendices. And after it was uh, completed, the project proponents were sued on the basis of inadequate environmental review. This was uh, this is sort of a, a typical example of, 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 a, of, a, of a large project. In, in the statute that we had drafted, the chairman of the Council of CEQ would have the authority to say, oh, you're just raising the roadway of the existing bridge using the existing foundations? Give me 50 pages on construction impacts. Three months later, that would be there on paper. People could still sue if they wanted to, and if there was no good faith environmental review, they should win. But otherwise, the project would save five years, save half the money, and, and, and move forward. But, but Trump's administration will not propose the legislation. Uh, I've testified before Congress most recently two weeks ago on this, uh, but this and other things will last a uh, year and a half. And the dysfunction of Washington is such that no one, starting with the Trump administration, but including members of Congress, can actually conceive of simply changing the rules to create clear lines of authority to make the judgments needed to build infrastructure. It's really not hard to do. It's not conceptually hard. There's not the, the Chamber of Commerce is for it. The unions are for it. It's not, it's not a partisan issue, uh, but they can't uh, do it. Uh, I've also been working on small business regulation where, again, you can't fix the problem. How can a small business owner understand 12,000 pages of rules? Just think about it. How can they possibly understand it? They don't know what's expected. How can they go to 11 different agencies to get permits for something? This is not the rule of law. It's some sort of water torture that we've imposed on, on citizens. Other countries, the OEC, most OECD countries now have one-stop shops. You show up in Portugal, many developing countries well, and there's a government official whose job it is to help you get your permit. How hard an idea of this. I mean, Mayor, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, one of the great things he did was the 311, part where you could call a complaint about city services. In the old days, you'd go through the yellow pages and spend a month getting, getting the runaround from people saying, oh, no, that's not my job, it's somebody else's job. So, um, but these are problems that can't be fixed under the current system. They need to be replaced. That's what regular, but Trump does not conceptually um, have this idea. He doesn't want to do the hard work of actually conceptualizing a new system and creating a, craftable, a practical framework for, for, for regulation. So his phrase is drain the swamp, and I, I don't think that's a bad metaphor. Um, I think it is a swamp, it's a jungle. But then you say, okay, so on T plus one, how will decisions be made once there's dry ground on Constitution Avenue? How will healthcare bureaucracy be reduced? How will teacher, how will schools work better? How will infrastructure get, uh, get approved and financed? And you, and you get a blank wall. They haven't thought about that. It's just all about the soundbite. And so what you have here, and we, we know is this kind of um, soundbite uh, governance. Now, to d criticize a few of the prior speakers, the last um, three or four Republican presidents have promised to fix the regulatory system. Some of the Democrats have as well. They have not done so. Why have they not done so? Because they focus on what's known as deregulation. That's what Trump really is about, too. He's really, you know, he's basically said, we're going to get rid of all the stupid regulations. And again, it's very appealing to say that because the regulations are stupid. <laughs> you know, stupid, there's, a, there's an OSHA regulation, stairwells shall be lit by natural or artificial light. That's helpful. The, um, I mean, you don't really have to have a rule. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, 
the problem here, and I've written about this, and I have a new book coming out saying we can't fix this system, we need to replace it, is it's not that we're regulating the wrong things. It's, you know, we want protect, people want protection against lead paint on the toys. People want clean water and pure food. They want oversight over shady, you know, business practices. All these things are, are, are goals that are important in an interdependent world with global commerce where, you know, with the people, you can't take care of yourself on many of these issues. But, but you can't solve those problems with what is now up to 150 million words of binding federal law and regulation, plus a couple of billion of state and local regulation. You really need to um, create a system that's more goal-oriented and doesn't try to create what is, in essence, uh, kind of a bad form of central planning, except that the planners are dead. You know, whoever wrote those rules in 1975 is no longer with us, and yet those rules dictate how special education works or, or how infrastructure works. So I think we need to step back and look at the importance of the, of the emotions that got Donald Trump elected, because I don't think it's all just due to racism, and although there's some of that. Um, and uh, vilification of immigrants, and there's certainly some of that. Uh, I think it's due to a general sense that things are out of anyone's control, and they are. They're out of anyone's control. No one can give the permit for the bridge. You know, no, you, know, you can't, you don't have authority to run the classroom. Forms are everywhere. Um, I tried to come up with a differential equation that would express this in a way that was completely obscure. But, um, but instead, in closing, I, I, I do, I've, I've hired a writer from The Daily Show to do a series of cartoon videos. And there's one of about a minute and a half I thought I would, I would close with. Can we make it work? Yeah, it's on mute. <laughs> President-elect Donald Trump vows to drain the swamp in Washington. Now, just about everyone agrees that there's a problem with the Potomac, and every president since Jimmy Carter has got to clear it out. But somehow the red tape just gets thicker. So why has everyone failed? Reformers end up getting tangled in the internal logic of the rules and ultimately overwhelmed because you can't prune a jungle with garden shears. I mean, I guess you could, but it would take forever. And in the meantime, the jungle would just keep growing all around you. Plus, there's <coughs> tigers and stuff. At the end of the day, we end up with thousand-page rule books that make it impossible for anyone to know what the rules actually are, and which require folks like doctors and teachers to fill out forms that no one reads, wasting billions of man hours a year on paperwork instead of things like patient care and teaching. Trump's idea is one in, two out. For each new regulation, remove two old ones. That would stop unchecked growth, but it would still take a few lifetimes to clean out the 150 million word tangle. Besides that, even the most ardent tea partiers would agree that we need things like clean water and safe products. So how do we clear out the bad while keeping the good? Well, that part isn't actually that hard. Just focus on results, not inputs. Australia did that with nursing homes, replacing dense regulations with 31 principles, things like provide a home-like setting. That let nurses tend to the needs of their residents rather than spending their days with their noses and rule books. Giving people goals and guiding principles rather than complex rules only takes a few pages. After all, an entire constitution is only 15 pages long. What matters is what works. If government radically simplified the law, it would allow people to focus on results instead of mindless bureaucracy, and the jungle of red tape would give way to a coherent framework of government. Fewer tigers, too. Yeah, metaphorical tigers. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, we, the, the, uh, the floor is to uh, Charlie. Please, Charlie. Oh. No, I'd like to control it. I can uh, actually uh, push buttons and read at the same time. Thank you. 
Well, that was really a pleasure to listen to Philip, so it's a pleasure to follow you and also Edmond on the panel. And uh, what I want to do is something really completely different. Uh, what I want to do is something completely different. I'll begin by speaking into the microphone, which is different from what I was doing. Um, regulation is a very important topic, and you'd think, given how important it, it is, that we would have a vast literature measuring the effects of regulation on economic activity and trying to come to grips with some of the things Philip was talking about. Uh, how much regulation is there and how do you measure that? How do you think about how it matters? Now, of course, uh, I want to tell you from the very beginning, we're not going to be focusing in this discussion at all on the benefits of regulation, be not that they're not worth focusing on, but we're not. Instead, we want to ask the question, how can you try to quantify the cost of regulation on the entities that are being regulated. So just the cost side. But here, just that narrow issue requires one dramatic step, and that is measuring regulation. So I'm going to talk today about a project that is ongoing. One of my co-authors is here in the front row, a PhD student at the business school. Uh, Roke Yang, and I have two other co-authors. And before I get into the weeds on this a little, I want to tell you uh, the conclusion from the perspective of the conference, because really I'm tricking you because I want to present ongoing research that I think is just interesting methodologically for thinking about how we do this difficult thing. Um, but I will tell you, so I think that the answer has the Trump administration done something constructive with respect to regulation is going to be yes. Um, that is, that it has reduced the adverse growth consequences uh, relative to the Obama administration. So I'm going to show you some evidence that I think qualitatively points in that direction. But about six months from now, I'm, I'm hoping that we're going to have much better evidence for you that's going to be quantitative. And to get to that point, what we've learned is why the existing measures of regulation, which we're going to employ in this paper, um, really aren't adequate for looking at changes like the Trump administration's policy changes. And then I'm going to tell you what we will be doing that we think addresses those gaps. So this is a little bit more of an economics presentation, but I, I hope you'll find it interesting because as far as we know, no one has looked at the quantification of regulation on firms that are being regulated before. Now, if we're wrong about that, please let us know. But we think that's pretty remarkable. So you're going to see what we think is maybe the first such study. OK, enough hype. So we're going to begin with um, measures that have been recently constructed at George Mason University. And when you look at these measures, uh, they're very simple, but what's crucial about them is that they try to associate regulations with particular industries at the three-digit disaggregated level. And that gives us a lot of hope as economists because it means that we have variation in our data, variation that allows us to exploit that variation to see how changes or differences over time in the amount of regulation that's occurring for one industry are affecting its performance relative to another industry that's experiencing a different amount of regulation. That's what's so exciting about the George Mason data. I'm not going to talk about how they do it, but I'm happy in the Q&A if someone's really interested to, to tell them, but of course you can also look it up. So they, they do it with two measures. One of them is just a way to take the total flow of regulation measured in words. Um, within the Code of Federal Regulations and associate it with particular three-digit industries. The other way that they do it is they look at the intensity of regulation measured in terms of uh, powerful restrictive words. We're going to call the first measure words and the second measure restrictions. Now I want to, you to notice two things about what's missing in these measures, and I'm not trying to be critical of the authors that constructed them, but I will point out that these are crucial for why there are limitations to what you can get from this. The first one is it doesn't tell you whether these 
regu this regulatory flow is important or not important. And I'm going to point out this is a, a major shortcoming. The other thing is that the effect of regulation should depend a lot on anticipation. So at turning points, um, a change in regulation that's expected to persist and maybe even be magnified in the future should have a bigger effect than one that's just temporary. And that's another problem. Please keep these two problems in mind because at the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about the data that we're currently using that we think is going to get be, uh, uh, allow us to deal with both of those problems. And that's exciting for us. Okay, so, but we're going to use what we have currently, which is these two George Mason measures based on textual analysis that look at word flow and in these two different ways. Uh, let me first just tell you, it's not going to matter which way you use. So I'll, I'll show you some evidence about that. They're going to give very similar kinds of answers. Um, so the first thing to notice, in case you can't see this, I'll tell you what it says and I'll show you a table in a minute. This looks at um, the unweighted um, flow of regulation that's an equal weighting of all the industries or one that's weighted by the employment of the industries. And what you can see, it's growing over time. And I think you can also see that 2017, the first year of the Trump administration, doesn't show any particular change from the trend. In fact, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and these, these um, the rest of these graphs, so you can see the, the second measure is almost identical. So what you see from this is um, there's really no visible reduction. in these trends, and, let, and what that's telling you, let me just show you a graph. So just to give you a sense of this, in terms of word flow of regulation, let's take the unweighted, so this is the, just the tip, simple uh, average across industries. For the Bush administration relative to the Clinton administration, regulation grew by 36%. And for the Obama administration relative to the Bush administration, it grew by 45%. If you weight by the employment in the industries, those are 46% and 47%. So the point is, there's not a huge difference. What about the first year of the Obama administration? In its first year, regulations grew by about 3%. What about the first year of the Trump administration? Well, on an unweighted basis, uh, regulations grew faster than they did in the first year of the Obama administration, and on a weighted basis, I'd say about the same. So the first thing to notice here is that this measure of regulation indicates no change, or maybe even an acceleration in regulation during the Trump administration. Please keep that in mind. I'm going to show you that that is not a very accurate characterization of what has happened. However, it is one characterization based on this measure. Now, if you look at, if you apply this methodology to say, suppose we take the, the growth that happened for each industry from the Bush years to the Obama years, and then we ask how much did firms in that industry, reported in CompuStat, how much did they react to the change that occurred in their particular industry? So now notice we have a lot of firms, we have 47 different uh, industries with a lot of cross-sectional variation in regulation. And we can then see whether over this, this is a cross-sectional regression, did the growth in regulation in your industry have a big effect on you, the growth of your sales and the growth of your employment? And the answer is, it had an absolutely huge effect. So these elasticities, as you can say, are C are somewhere between about negative 0.2 and negative 0.3. And given that regulation is growing at something like a third, that's 30 some percent, yes, uh, what that's telling you is something fairly hard to believe. What it's telling you is based on this cross-sectional identification, the, um, if the Obama era had been not increasing regulation at all, the counterfactual would be that CompuStat firms would have had 10% more employees at the end of the Obama administration than they actually had. Now, that is remarkable. 
do we believe that result? No, we don't believe that result. We think that's too large to be credible. But there's nothing wrong with this methodology that we're adopting. Um, it, it, there's, I think that there's something we will come back to in a minute. There's, it, but what it's telling us is that there's some information in these George Mason data. The information they're capturing workflow and associating it with three-digit industries is very useful for figuring out which industries grew or shrank relative to one another. Now, let's apply the same thing to the first year of the Trump administration. But remember, the Trump administration experienced a similar growth in total words to the Obama administration. And the answer is there's no effect. Now, you could say, well, that's, maybe that's just because in first years of administrations, you don't see much of an effect. So let's look at the first year of the Obama administration. Huge effect. In fact, maybe even bigger than the average effects over the whole eight years. Maybe people saw regulatory changes coming and reacted even more in the first year. So that's kind of interesting. What I think it's telling us is that when the Trump administration takes uh, office, they basically don't stop the flow of the formalized writing of regulations. That's almost a function of how many typewriters and bureaucrats you have. But what they did was they reduced the number of regulations that were meaningful. And they may also have been sending a signal that regulations were gonna be declining in the future. So in other words, this measure, which we find is this measure of total word flow, which seems to have been pretty useful in understanding the change from the Obama administration relative to the Bush administration, while we think likely overstating the, the, the economic effects of that for some reason we don't understand, um, just doesn't come in at all important during the first year of the Trump administration. So let's see, is it the case that part of the story could be those, those two effects? We, we thought though there might be three reasons. One reason could be that there's just some sort of coincidental negative correlation between the tax law's cross-sectional incidence, that is which firms are affected by the tax law and which firms are in the regulated industries. So we went back to the barrow Furman art article that you heard about before, and we looked at the factors that should matter from the tax law for individual firms, and we controlled for those. It had no effect on our results. So this result of the lack of any information from these measures for the Trump years is not the result of an omitted variable bias because we didn't take account of the tax law. So we think it's the result of the other two on this list, which I've already mentioned. One of them being regulations became on average much less important during the first year of the Trump administration and less costly therefore to firms. And secondly, that there was an indication dynamically that regulations were going to be re declining in the future. Now, notice that the Code of Federal Regulations is a lagging indicator of regulatory policy. And so that's what, so I'm gonna talk about these two aspects. So notice here, first in terms of importance of regulation, now we have a measure, unfortunately they do not disaggregate by sectors they don't have a textual analysis that does that. But at George Washington University, they measure important regulations. And you can see how different this graph looks from the graphs I showed you. If you look at important regulations, roughly regulations that have a significant economic consequence for the regulated industry, which they measure using the standard cost-benefit analysis that comes out of the compliance, um, what you see is that, that dramatic dropping off of that red line on the far end. So what the Trump administration did was it didn't slow down the number of pages of the Code of Federal Regulation that were produced. It just made that those, that those pages that were produced very unimportant in terms of the economic costs of the new ones that were being created. The second thing to notice is, now if, instead if using the Code of Federal Regulation, we had used the Federal Register and just counted the number of pages you would see a dramatic decline. Why? Because the, the code of regulations is the final regulations only. 
whereas the Federal Register includes executive orders but also proposed regulations. So what it's telling us is that the dynamic path of regulation is downward. So if you were a market participant paying attention to regulation on average, what you knew was that regulations were becoming, on average, per page, much less costly, and that secondly, the regulatory flow was about to be reduced in, in future years. Okay, but we don't have cross-sectional evidence on this. These are just aggregates, so we can't perform the kind, we can't correct our simple measure to be able to come up with a corrected version um, of the George Mason measure. So what did we do? What are we going to do? Um, I'm, I'm not going to present the survey evidence. I'm not going to talk about that either. I want to talk about what we're going to do. So what we think it, uh, is very promising is to use two sources that will allow us to gauge better for each of these industries the importance of regulation that firms and their investors are seeing in real time on a forward-looking basis, not just the current flow, but what they're also expecting in terms of the importance. Where are we going to get that? Two sources. One is a Thomson Reuters newsfeed, which we are performing our own textual analysis of. Uh, and the other one is the, for the S&P 500 companies to actually look at their um, corporate calls when they have their earnings reports and they discuss with their investors what's going on. So we're going to do a textual analysis to look at things like how many times are important words relating to regulation mentioned. Are they mentioned early on in the meeting? Are they the subject of questions that the investors ask? So we think that actually it's not going to be too hard to measure importance and on a forward-looking basis importance by using those two sources. And within a few months, we expect to have results from a panel regression that will do that analysis at least for the last decade and possibly more. So we'll be able to go back to the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and the Trump administration in a consistent way using measures that are qualitative, qualitatively weighted and forward-looking. So I think, uh, just to conclude, I think what we have here is evidence that the potential impact of regulatory flow is quite large. In the Obama administration, they seem to have uh, caused a fair amount of harm, although I don't want to take these uh, results that we have too seriously in terms of quantitative measure. And so the possibility for reforms of regulation um, are, I think, quite promising for economic activity and particularly if we can get people like Philip more involved in them. And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me uh, make a brief, brief comments uh, on uh, Charlie's and Philip's uh, presentation. On uh, Charlie's use of the Code of Federal Regulation for measuring regulation through a quantitative analysis of sectoral world flow, is, I must say, canny and, 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 and very interesting. It leads to some provisional results when it comes to compare uh, regulation under Obama and Trump. Uh, the, this exercise is promising and, and deserves to be deepened. But as Charlie knows perfectly, it presents a series of problems. First, uh, in, in, in the analysis of the first year of the new administration, it's difficult to gauge uh, what belongs to the new and to the previous team. Second, the scope of regulation is much broader. What about trade policy, for example, and financial regulation, which might have a much bigger impact than uh, many rules in the code? And third, the, the quantitative approach cannot fully grasp the effects of regulation. Some are necessary and just, others detrimental to the economy. How to make a judgment on regulation without taking into account the risk, eventually avoided, damages or negative externalities caused by the lack of regulation? Now, concerning uh, Philippe's um, um, intervention, we leave the realm of economics and enter into the field of politics, which uh, a field I'm familiar with. Um, if the pledge of, of Philippe is to get rid of uh, regulations which are not necessary, to streamline the rules, 
to reduce red tape and to facilitate our everyday life and the life of, enter and, uh, of enterprises, we can all agree. And uh, the farther we go, the better. That's, that's uh, obvious. But um, the objective, uh, as presented uh, by, uh, by Philip, is more ambitious. It is to answer, I quote, the frustration, alienation, and powerlessness of the citizens which need to be re-empowered uh, because they know what the common good is. But they, they already exist in our democracies, a very complex governance at the local, state, and, and federal level, which allows the people to express their views and defend, and defend their interests in a framework which is such that the various positions and interests can be taken into account. So if I clearly, if I come back to what I said about the French Revolution, if I clearly see why the French Revolution changed the old order, I have some difficulty to understand how Trump will remake the, 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 the system as it exists actually in the US. Let, this leads me to, to bring a short contribution to this debate on regulation. I will simplify. The political debate in the US uh, or in France or in many countries in, by the opposition between those who are on the left whose priority is to fight excessive income inequalities and those sitting more on the right who favor deregulation considering that a free market economy is the best recipe for economic growth and full employment. And uh, I will show you first a, a very simple graph which is in all the textbooks. Please, can you? Okay, you, you have, the, you have a, in this very simple supply-demand chart, you see that uh, obviously income redistribution needs the levy of taxes. But this levy of taxes reduces producers' surplus, consumers' surplus, and it moves the economy away from the maximum level of output which could be available in the markets. So if we keep in mind this device, uh, let us look at, uh, at the trade-off between income inequalities and income growth through the figures over the last 20 years. Can I have the, 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 the table, please? I have it? Okay. In uh, six countries, USA, France, Germany, UK, Sweden, and Denmark. That's a very interesting uh, graph. I took the, the last 20 years. Uh, it, it, it is before Trump's administration because uh, uh, for the uniformity of the statistics, I, I, I was forced to stop at 2016. Comparing France and the US, you see that the US has been posting a higher rate of economic growth and a lower rate of unemployment than France, while the Gini index is higher in the US. Uh, but you can observe as well that the public and social expenditures is much lower in the US and relatively stable, while in France it is much higher and increasing <coughs> over the period. When you look at France and other Euro European countries, you can see that compared to the UK, you have the same trade-off than in the US. But when opposed to the Nordic countries, Sweden and Denmark, France's performance in terms of economic growth and unemployment is not as good, and its Gini index is much higher. If you, if you accept the notion of optimum reg, re, re, regulation, which I have to, to confess is somehow, if somehow politically biased, I draw the conclusion that France is probably overregulated. You see it through the level of public and social expenditures, which has increased during the period in France, while it, while it has decreased, as you see, in all the countries except Denmark, which has increased but to a lesser extent than France. In my view, France, through deregulation, could simultaneously increase its welfare through higher growth, but also improves its Gini index. That should probably uh, need a significant decrease in the level of public and social expenditures. And this is what our President Emmanuel Macron is trying to do. As for President Trump's policy on this matter, I will, just observe, I will just observe that you start in this country from a position which is in terms of growth and employment much better than my country. 
and uh, better than many, many countries in Europe. Does it leave room for more redistribution? That is another problem which I leave to you Americans. Thank you. <laughs> Please, we have uh, seven minutes for questions and answers. I have a two-part question, and uh, this is a very naive, these are both very naive questions, so I hope you'll, I'm not an economist. The first question I have regarding pages, like millions of pages of regulation is, <clears throat> if you have millions of pages of regulation and the regulated have no hope of delving through it all, wouldn't that imply that the regulators have no hope of delving through it all and would not, and by default it would not, all these millions of pages would not be enforced? Let me, let me just get to the second one. So that would be to Philip. And then to Charles I would ask, and this is really even more naive than the first question, isn't this just like an AI puzzle? Like, I mean, shouldn't, I'm trying to think of something entrepreneurial I might want to do that I can imagine would have just an ungodly amount of regulation. And say, I want to buy a plot of land in Manhattan and open a cemetery there. <laughs> so if there's all these millions of pages of regulation, I mean, isn't there conceivably you could just build Alexa and you could say, Alexa, what would it take to build a cemetery and to buy a plow land in Manhattan? And if that question required Alexa more than 12 minutes to answer, then just create somebody I can complain to <laughs> to fix it, instead of just diving into all this millions of pages of idiocy. On the first question, uh, there are um, studies of a fashion, they're not, um, um, they're not quantitative studies, but they're studies by academics on the enforce on the implementation of of um, of and enforcement of regulations. And what they suggest is that is that regulations are uh, enforced uh, selectively, depending on the particular regulator. So that, for example, a study of nursing home regulators in Illinois found that depending on the inspector they would each enforce roughly 5 to 10% of the rules. There'd be a different 5 to 10%, depending on which, which regulator it was. I mean, so one of the, uh, the, the unfairness of, quote, clear law, written in thousands of rules, is that it's enforced essentially randomly. And therefore, the risk of, uh, and therefore, the cost of the regulation is even it's, higher. It's, oh, it's much greater. and so. Um, we, I didn't talk about this, but one of the aspects of, of this system we built up in the last 50 years, more or less, is, is our waves of defensiveness, where the, where the assumption, can we do this, the assumption is always no, not unless, you, you know, not unless we have to. Lawyers get paid a lot of money simply to say, no, there might be a risk, a legal risk. And so you have that response. It certainly, uh, for example, impeded uh, infrastructure investment, there have been studies of that, because the uncertainty on timing is such that, that people won't invest upfront money to plan an infrastructure project because no one can tell them what the timetable is for approval. Uh, Charlie? Yes, so simple answer to your question. Alexa couldn't answer that question. Um, and furthermore, no one has tried to do it. So, you know, you may have this thing in your head that's saying, well, I know that somewhere in the cloud, somebody who does data science has done such a thing. No, we're doing it. So the textual analysis of Thomson Reuters, for example, 17 million news articles, to convert it into statements about the economic meaning of that is something Harry and Mimeski and I just completed a couple years ago, and we have a paper coming out in the Journal of Financial Economics making use of that and showing that there are lots of things people haven't noticed before that can be predicted if you look at, if you know how to do a flexible analysis of 17 million news articles. Has that been done by anyone in Wall Street, for example? The answer is no. And we are 
giving presentations at a lot of Wall Street conferences telling people about it. So you may be thinking, if something makes sense to do, someone's already done it. Um, that is not true. Please. Hold on a second, because the, the camera wants you. Well, thank you for the presentation, and the question maybe to Howard and, the, and all of you here. So it's about the um, enforceability of regulations. You say it introduces risk in the economy and so on. So the question is, um, all of you, what would, do you think is uh, the underlying driver of all this regulation? And um, why I ask this is because all systems, of course, are based on principles. And uh, Howard seemed to challenge the whole system. So what kind of principle then would you propose to be the new sort of underlying? And I also would like to hear from Edmund there on his sort of more political economic view and how Charles is going to find out the answer. Yeah, it's a really important question. The, the debate uh, boringly for decades has been regulation versus deregulation. Um, I think that's, that debate is large, not entirely, but largely in the, in the wrong dimension. Uh, the, to me, the much more important question, which, which Charles's analysis also brings up, which is it's really what you're regulating and how you're regulating it. And so it's, it's an effectiveness, um, um, it's an effectiveness analysis. There have been studies of with the worker safety rules, 4,000 worker safety rules, basically suggest that they've done nothing to improve worker safety. These rules have been in place for, for 50 years, uh, and if, if, you, if you correct for general improvements in workplace conditions that are not related to OSHA and other things, the, the, the net effect is virtually zero. How could that be? They require the, because it turns out that the most important thing in worker safety is actually attitudes and training. And it's the human element of keeping people with, with a safe mindset. And, and that, can't, that does, has nothing to do with what model saw you have or little to do you know, in, in your workplace. So um, it, it's sort of a microeconomic problem, which is how do, you, how do you create regulations that incentivize people to comply with public goals in a way that's efficient. And what we've done is we've created a system of regulation designed to tell people in advance how to do something correctly as if there was one way to do something correctly. When life is filled with you know, infinite challenges and infinite circumstances. So it's, it, um, and I've written a number of books, each of which costs about $25.95, uh, which I recommend that you purchase. And, um, uh, and, and we can talk about this later. I have a new book coming out about this. But, but truly, uh, it's like the cartoon video. You know, Australia got rid of 1,000 rules, replaced it with 31 principles. With one, within one year, the nursing homes were dramatically better. Everyone understood what's expected of them. The regulators could go in and have arguments. The family members could come in and talk about, does this have a home-like setting? Do you respect the dignity of the residents? All these general things. They argued about it, and the nursing homes got better because they had a different way of regulating. Uh, your, your question is very interesting. I've been a, a politician, a member of parliament. I've been uh, there for many, many years, uh, and I've been even a finance minister in France. So I've been on the other side. Of, um, um, and but uh, why is there are there so so many uh, uh, rules, uh, so many legislation, all over the world? Um, uh, I think that unfortunately, it is the people. The people want more regulation. That's unbelievable, but it's true. The, 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 the world is very complex. People want more security. They want to be defended. They want, they want everything. And the, the reaction of the, the politicians is to try to, to fulfill these needs. And so we, we need, my guess, uh, because I'm very 
free market. Um, I, I have always been a free market politician, and I, very, I, I have be, always been against this amount of legislation, which is really dramatic for the for the for the economic growth and and, and, and even for welfare. So, what to do uh, to avoid this tremendous move in favor of more and more laws every day, every day? That's unbelievable. I think that we need some kind of constitutional guidelines. And uh, that would be probably the answer. To force the, the, the members in parliament to limit their, their, their legislation to general rules and not to go into much detail. But that, that has to be accepted. And I'm, I'm afraid that it would not be very popular. So we have maybe one word with Charlie, and after, no, Charlie, no, it's I okay? Don't think I have a... Then I'm sorry, but we are out of time. Thank you very much for your attention.